Good morning, Bitcoiners, and welcome back to your economic calendar, where we cover the news and insights you need for the week ahead in Bitcoin. Today is Monday, June 28th, and as always, we have a pretty special episode. In today's show, we're going to start by talking about how institutions are investing through the Bitcoin price dip. We've seen a lot of institutional activity recently, and we're going to be touching into those details. Second, we're going to give an update on DeFi, where we've seen quite a few rug pulls and regulation chatter throughout last week, which may continue into this week. And last, with so much riding on the Fed, so much emphasis on the Fed by the markets recently, we're going to take a look at the recent economic data and how that fits in with the Fed's view, as well as all the Fed activity that's on cue for this week. So, as always, grab your coffees. It's going to be a good one. Starting as we usually do with Bitcoin, we see that it was another volatile week for Bitcoin, reaching lows in the mid 28,000s. Um, which had not been, which were levels that had not been seen uh, since really January fourth earlier this year, um, and it closed the week um, at thirty four thousand six hundred ninety nine dollars, down two point five percent for the week. Now um, we can see that the close for the week was actually right in line with the weekly close of the week of May nineteenth. However, if we look down at the volumes, we see that the traded volume last week was around half of that what it was on May 19th, on the week of May 19th. Uh, If we take a look at some other indicators, and this was an interesting chart that was published last week uh, from Glassnode. Now, the chart that you have on the back of your screen right now uh, shows the realized net profits or losses on Bitcoin based on the on-chain movements. So basically based on the price that those Bitcoins were when they last moved chain versus the price that it is when they are moving the chain right now. So it's essentially a benchmark to see how many booked profits or how many realized profits or losses investors have booked uh, just by judging on the timing of the movement of those coins. So as we can see here, while the traded volume from last from this last week was nowhere near the traded volume in the week of May 19th, what we can appreciate is that the realized losses um, essentially are reaching a maximum point. Now, this, to put it in context, we have seen more realized losses or we saw more realized losses last week than we did in the week of March 2020th. Now, when investors book uh, these types of losses, and as you can see from the graph here, Whenever there are big spikes down, uh, that can be interpreted by some as capitulation in the market. And essentially, a lot of investors giving up their positions just because they did not have the means to maintain them and giving opportunities to other investors to step in uh, and purchase those with more conviction or a potentially lower uh, base so that they can be in it for a longer period of time. On that precise topic, this price drop has provided a or created a good buying opportunity for opportunistic long-term investors and the article you have on your screen right now is essentially the listing or report that came out last week from kathy woods arc invest who actually made quite a few moves last week during the price dip and um, to highlight some of those price dips uh, arc invest added 1.2 million shares of gbtc to its holdings bringing gbtc now to be the seventh largest holding in their fund accounting for 4.2% of their total assets. Similarly, in the article behind you, you, it also notes that ARK Invest added another 280,000 shares of Coinbase, making Coinbase the 10th largest holding in their portfolio at 3.5% of their total assets. These are strong conviction buys. Now, again, in the topic of institutional investor conviction, um, we see that Andreessen Horowitz raised a $2.2 billion crypto fund and said that it is radically optimistic despite the price fluctuations. Um, Now, these are signals that institutional investors are not seeing Bitcoin or crypto as a passing trend, and they continue to invest heavily in the infrastructure layer, which is a testament to the long-term potential they see in the space. Now, looking back at some of the market fundamentals for Bitcoin, um, what you have behind your screen right now is the futures curve for the Bitcoin uh, futures markets. Now, looking at this curve, you see that we are still seeing backwardation across the board for July and quite a bit of August. So again, backwardation is when the price for the future contract of that month is trading below the spot price today. 
Typically in Bitcoin, we tend to see a contango, which is all subsequent months are priced higher than spot. Right now, we are not seeing that. We're continuing to see backwardation on the futures curves. Additionally, the perpetual swaps funding rates are all consistently, consistently negative. They were last night at the time of writing. We can do another check again this morning. Uh, but the futures rates, yeah. And so we see here that the futures rates are squarely negative across the board. Kraken, Binance, uh, who will be pretty much all major exchanges are showing negative funding rates for the perpetual swaps. Um, we're going to talk about this and a few more fundamentals in our what's ahead section later today. However, these typically, so the backwardation and the negative funding rates on the perpetual future swaps tend to mean that the market expects some sideways to lower price action in the near future. Moving over to the S&P 500, we see that it was a great week for U.S. equities. The S&P last week booked a fresh new all-time high of 4,286 points, uh, and it was up 3.20% for the week. Now, the NASDAQ, looking back at the NASDAQ, it also booked a fresh all-time high last week closing up 2.10% at 14,345 points. And we also saw the Dow Jones Industrial essentially had a pretty good week, up 3.44% at 34,433 points. However, it did not reach all-time highs the way the S&P and the NASDAQ did. Now, as we covered last week, I um, wanted to put in this headline behind your screen right now. Um, as we covered here last week, markets rallied higher on Friday, which th there was supposed to be a very important day. And that day was the a release of the personal, con personal expenditures consumption reading for May in the United States. Now, that reading in May came in at 3.9%, lower than the Fed's target for 2021 of 4.3%, and way lower than, than May's 5% consumer price index jump. So if we take a look at the markets here and zoom out to the daily, we see that the markets rallied into a fresh all-time high on Friday, basically on the back of that news. And um, um, again, somewhat to be expected as what this means is that inflations are coming in essentially below the Fed targets, at least on the PCE uh, level and that appeases the market because it essentially reinforces this view of the potential transitory inflation. Um, similarly, on that note, we saw that uh, existing home sales, as we covered here last week, that we were going to get this data last week, existing home sales also fell for the fourth consecutive month as home prices continue to soar. Again, both of these data points reinforce the Fed's view for transitory inflation. Now, we often highlight how important the Federal Reserve posture is for markets in general, including Bitcoin. And charts can drive this point home even better than words. The chart that you're going to see just now, uh, give me a second here. Now it's a chart that's behind your screen now. This chart is uh, depicting the S&P 500 in terms or in Fed balance sheet terms dating back to 1995. So as you can see, the market peaked in Fed terms in 2001, 2002. And according to this benchmark, we are currently at levels similar to, that, to those of 2009. So for context, the, uh, in 2010, the S&P 500 traded pretty range bound at 1,150 points. Um, and right now it is trading well north of 4,000 points. So something to keep in mind. Now, this week is going to be very important as we get unemployment data on Friday and look for this to be a decisive day in equity markets. We will go over this and more in a lot more detail in our what's ahead section later today. Moving over to gold, we see that gold caught a bid last week and it closed higher by 96 base points, almost 1% at $1,780 per ounce. Um, the dollar index last week was down 55 base points which gave a breather to other commodities as well. Now, looking at some of the headlines around gold, um, we had a headline come out last week from CNBC uh, stating that uh, gold was set for a weekly gain as inflation data comps Fed taper fears. Um, this was actually published earlier uh, in the week last week, so it was talking about last week's price action. 
In this article itself, uh, Kidco senior analyst for metals, Jim Wickoff, comments that he expects to see more selling pressure in gold this week given a bearish technical backdrop. And interestingly, uh, going back to our gold um, chart here, we've been highlighting this this downtrend that it has since august and it's it's actually we can see gold uh, squarely bumping up against that top range of uh, or top line of that descending range so again um, mr wickoff at kipco expects further uh, bearish price action this week looking at these trend lines uh, it looks like um, this would not be uh, completely out of out of the out of whack. So it, it does look, uh, you know, we tend to concur with Mr. Wickoff's view. So something to keep an eye out in gold. Again, this uh, market may react to Friday's announcement of the unemployment numbers. Moving over to DeFi, it was a week of rug pulls and regulation chatter around the sector. Um, looking at the price action, we see that the index, uh, DeFi index, finished last week down 19.89 percent at 6,245 points. Um, looking at Ethereum, it also finished the week down double digits, uh, down 11.57 percent at 1,983, below that all-important $2,000 psychological um, threshold for Ethereum. Now. On the rug pull front, and I'm just going to put up some of the headlines behind your screen now. On the rug pull front, we saw two projects go down last week. One called Shared Stake, uh, which is the one that you have in the headline behind you, and another one called Polywhale. Now, while both projects were relatively unknown to the masses, it continues to highlight just how risky the DeFi sector is. Now, on that note, we also uh, saw a bunch of chatter around regulation and DeFi last week. Now, the article that you have behind you or behind your screen came out over the weekend from the Financial Times, and it reports that actually over the weekend, representatives from global regulators met with members of the Uniswap decentralized exchange, as well as DYDX, which is a decentralized derivatives exchange, as well as others. And the article notes that representatives from both the SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, and the CFTC attended the meeting. These are two of the top regulators in the United States. Now, furthering on that, on that thread, Mark Cuban's cry for stablecoin regulation last week seems to have landed on some Fed officials' ears. Um, last week, the Boston Fed president, Eric Rosengreen, highlighted that Tether, or highlighted Tether as a new disruptor under the challenges section of his presentation on financial stability. Uh, we're just going to find the... Um, uh, Mr. Rosengreen's slide. So this is actually a, an excerpt of the slide itself. And you can see that Tether was mentioned in the context of exploring three financial stability challenges. And again, here you see he, it was listed as a new disruptor. We're going to be going into this, uh, into a lot more detail in this in our What's Ahead section today. Uh, but lastly, we wanted to highlight that in other basically um, regulatory news for DeFi and for the space in general, the Financial Action Task Force, often known as FAFT, uh, was scheduled to publish its draft guidance on anti-money laundering uh, policies around virtual currencies this last Friday. Now, that publication of that draft guidance was delayed uh, due to the large amount of feedback that has, that has been received uh, by uh, industry participants. Now, the draft uh, AML uh, regulation or guidance, sorry, has now been delayed until October later this year. So something to keep our eyes out as, um, again, there's a few comments and laws that are in the commentary period, uh, very close to continuing to hear new developments on this. So any development on either the FAF law or laws coming out of the U.S. can very likely move the market. So it's really good to know where those uh, pending announcements could be coming from. Now, moving on to our Bitcoin mining difficulty commentary, the large number of miners that have been taken offline in China have caused hash rate in Bitcoin to plummet. Now, in plain English, this means that because there are less computers trying to solve the problem, the solutions can take more than 10 minutes to be found on average. Now, in order to set an average time of 10 minutes for finding each solution, the difficulty to solve the problem must be brought down. And again, uh, just wanted to show the article that came out from Bitcoin Magazine over the weekend um, that states that 
there is a very large difficulty adjustment coming for Bitcoin. In the view of Bitcoin Magazine, it is very likely to be the largest difficulty adjustment in the history of Bitcoin. Now, it's, it's still a bit early to tell how uh, just how large the adjustment itself will be because the adjustment is scheduled for Thursday, Friday this week. But based on the data, it looks like it very well could be the largest downward adjustment for, dif for Bitcoin difficulty in its history. Now, what does this mean? Not much really to the end user of Bitcoin, other than the fact that blocks will now be produced much faster. And then the added takeaway for that is that the miners that are still active will now have a higher chance of average revenues as there are now less computers competing to solve the same blocks and to earn the same rewards. Now, as always, we leave you with what's ahead for the week. So as we've, as we've mentioned, the cooling off in the personal consumption expenditures index that we saw last week, as well as the four consecutive drops in new home sales, in addition to the free fall in lumber prices that we are seeing, are all reinforcing this transitory inflation view from the Fed. Now, with all that said, we are starting to see some subtle tapering signals from the Fed. One such tapering signal is what's happening in the reverse repo facility. So the Fed's New York bank raised the rate on its reverse repo facility to five basis points from 0%. Now, this is the Fed's overflow facility to prevent negative interest rates. In this facility, banks can lend the Fed cash by purchasing treasuries from the Fed's reverse repo facility and then having the Fed buy them back on the next day. This gives the bank a place to park their money now at above 0% interest rate. Now, while the transitory inflation narrative is getting some validation, the Fed and the market's attentions will be turned to the very uh, the, the other very important indicator that the Fed tracks, which is unemployment. Now, we get a slew of data on Thursday and Friday this week and look for the market to cheer an unemployment rate above 5.8%. As we mentioned in the DeFi section also, Tether seems to have caught the Fed's attention. The fact that the Boston Fed President Rosengren dedicated one full slide to Tether's balance sheet signals that they are not just glancing at it. And here is an excerpt of the uh, slide that Mr. Rosengreen showed in his presentation. Now, while anything the Fed does will take a long time to play out, we're starting to see some interesting moves uh, for Tether in the market. One such move is the graph you have behind your screen right now. Last week saw the largest Tether inflows into exchanges since 2019. Now, while this could just be a coincidence, it will be interesting to keep an eye at Tether flows and on the market capitalization of other stable coins, namely USDC, in the context of all this news flow uh, around Tether. Uh, we will likely learn more about the Fed's view on stablecoin in today's speech by Randall Quarles, um, and the rest of the week is also full of economic data. So let's go summarize what's ahead for this week in terms of Fed activity. So to summarize it, on Monday, today at 9 a.m. Eastern, we get New York Fed President John Williams at the Bank for International Settlements panel. So again, just the market will be listening intently to all Fed officials or representatives in their public appearances. At 1.10 p.m. Eastern, we get Vice Chair for Supervision Randall Quarles giving a speech about central bank digital currency at the 2021 Utah Bankers Association Annual Convention. That those will be the two main events for today. Now, tomorrow, Tuesday, 9.30 a.m. Eastern, we get Richmond Fed President Tom Barkin doing an interview. And on Thursday, we have at 8.30 a.m. Eastern, initial and continuing jobless claims. This will be very important. The market will be watching this intently because a lot of the information on this Thursday data point could feed into Friday's unemployment rate announcement, which brings us to Friday. There's a lot of unemployment data coming out on Friday at right at 8.30 a.m. Eastern. The most closely watched will be the actual unemployment rate itself. So again, lots of writing on that unemployment number, big week of economic data coming out. And as always, we will keep you posted of all relevant information right here on the Your Bitcoin Economic Calendar and in our social media at Hoddle with Lennon. If you have any questions and comments on the materials that we covered today, I welcome you to leave them down in the comments section. Uh, and we'll try to include it in our next episode. If you learned something today, if you enjoyed, enjoyed the show, I welcome you to like it, subscribe it, and share it with your friends. 
If you don't yet have a Ledin account, I welcome you to check out Ledin.io and learn how you can start earning 9.5% APY on your USDC and 6.1% on your first two Bitcoin. We also have market leading rates on our loans at 9.5% interest. So check us out at Ledin.io. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful week and see you next time.